tonight on CBC Vancouver News. The victim of a fatal crash on the Coquihalla Highway is being called a good Samaritan, just trying to help someone out. There's human waste problems. Uh, they are camping close to neighborhoods, so they're disturbing locals. Cracking down, van dwellers along the Sea to Sky are fearful their homes may be threatened. <gasps> it's coming right at us. Orca is putting on a show on BC's coast. This is CBC Vancouver News. Good evening. We're learning more tonight about a man pronounced dead at the scene after a crash on the Coquihalla Highway. He's being called a good Samaritan, someone who stopped to help another group. For more on this, we're joined by Leanne Young. Leanne, take us through how it all happened. Well, Anita, the 48-year-old was someone who just pulled over to try and help after he saw an accident off the side of the road last night. Merritt RCMP tells us that the initial accident was minor, no injuries, and the two drivers were exchanging information off the side of the road. That's when the accident victim stopped to help. Then, a chain reaction. Two other vehicles slammed into them. Joshua Knack was there right after the accident, and he describes a frantic scene. People doing chest compressions on on one person, the vehicle that was in the middle, and then a very badly, a, a really badly uh, smashed up vehicle on the other side. Another ambulance came up and, it, and, and they, it looked like there was a victim I was identified underneath that vehicle. At least that's what one of the tow truck drivers said. And uh, so there was quite a bit of focus on them as well. So eventually there were three ambulances and, uh, and a fire rescue truck and then two of the helicopters just came in. Sadly, the Good Samaritan died right at the scene. Six people in total were taken to hospital with injuries, including a driver and passenger from that initial accident. Two people are in critical condition and four others are in stable condition. A very sad story, but Leanne, this isn't the first time a Good Samaritan has been killed on a busy highway, is it? No, it isn't. In fact, this is the third time it's happened in recent memory. A mother of two died in 2017 along Highway 1 when she and her husband stopped to help after an accident. And then last February, a 35-year-old man was killed when he pulled over to help two victims on the Coquihalla. Of course, then we have the accident that happened just yesterday. And while police have a general sense of what happened, Merritt RCMP say the investigation into that crash continues. Anita? All right, thanks very much, Leanne. Well, can public trust be restored at the provincial capital? That's the question tonight after a damning report confirming several cases of misconduct by top officials at the B.C. legislature. Provincial Affairs reporter Tanya Fletcher now on why it may take a long time to rebuild public confidence. There needs to be a total airing of what's taken place here because that's the first step to regaining public trust. He's referring to the mysterious terms around the sudden departure of Clerk Craig James. He was found to be in misconduct on many of the allegations, including the creation of a quarter million dollar pension benefit. It's still unclear whether he'll have to repay any of the public dollars that were misspent. The government will only say James retired immediately after reaching a non-financial agreement. Uh, certainly, I think if he was uh, the recipient of a benefit he was not entitled to, which is quite clear in terms of the pension benefit, uh, that money should be paid back. Findings of misconduct aside, the report points to a wider problem of the way the legislature is run. Beverly McLaughlin writes, many of the problems I was asked to investigate and many of the frustrations expressed by employees who testified arose from a lack of clarity and accountability in the administrative structure of the Legislative Assembly. My role as someone, I think McLaughlin made it clear, it wasn't always clear to me, but she made it clear that I'm the person who's responsible for the overall oversight of, of operations. The special investigator didn't hold back in her criticism of the speaker either, even though he was the one who flagged these concerns in the first place. Referring to Daryl Plekis, she says he seems to have seen his task as to build a credible criminal type case against Mr. James and Mr. Lenz, rather than promptly confronting and correcting the administrative practices that he questioned. As for why no misconduct was found on several of the allegations, political watchdogs say you can't break a rule that doesn't exist. If there is an absence of detailed policy, you can't hold somebody responsible uh, for extravagant spending in terms of misconduct. 
Sergeant at Arms Gary Lenz was cleared entirely in this report. He hopes the pending RCMP investigation paves the way for his return to work. Meanwhile, it's now up to an all party committee to permanently fill the role of the clerk. Tanya Fletcher, CBC News, Victoria. The BC Federation of Labor says it is disturbed after learning the Aquilini family shortchanged some migrant workers. A branch of the BC government found the Aquilinis, who own the Vancouver Canucks, underpaid 174 employees at the family's berry farm in Pitt Meadows last summer. It's reprehensible. You have 170 uh, workers from Guatemala that came over on a promised contract of 40 hours a week. Uh, for six months and uh, they didn't receive the promise of that contract by an employer who has uh, great wealth. The workers were brought in from Guatemala to work at the Golden Eagle Blueberry Farm. Yesterday, the Aquilinis were ordered to pay the workers $133,000 in back wages, vacation pay and interest. In a statement, Golden Ears Farm we says are we are to proud job. to provide jobs that help support our workers and their families. The contract was new and unique. We accept the decision and have paid the settlement amount. The Aquilinis are reported to be among the top 30 richest families in Canada. For more on this story, you can head to our website, cbc.ca slash bc. Well, they live in vans along the Sea to Sky corridor, and now hundreds of them are worried they may be forced to pay hefty fines. As Rafferty Baker reports, the fears are as a result of the District of Squamish considering a crackdown on what it calls nuisance campers. She has her own little shelf right here that you can see. She's currently reading Lord of the Rings. And no, so Lord, Lord of, of the Flies. Flies. Sorry, Lord of the Flies. She doesn't like Lord of the Rings. Thomasina Pigeon and her 12-year-old daughter Cedar call this converted minivan in Squamish home. Pigeon has lived in vans for the better part of 20 years. Her daughter pretty much her whole life. I mean, you could take everything with you. So if you're driving to somewhere and you're like, oh no, I forgot something. Oh wait, my house is right outside. <laughs> so that's nice. For Pigeon, the lifestyle is a choice. She prefers minimalism and the low environmental impact, but it's also a matter of means. But Squamish has become such a magnet for outdoor enthusiasts, many of whom travel and live in vans, that it's become a problem for some neighbours and district officials. They leave garbage, which is a bear attractant, putting our wildlife at risk. Um, they, there's human waste problems. Uh, they are camping close to neighbourhoods, so they're disturbing locals. Elliot says the problem is a minority of the roughly 3,000 van-dwelling visitors. And she says the goal of the proposed bylaw isn't to target folks who live and work in Squamish, but to target messy travellers. It's a nuisance camping bottle. We're trying to take care of the folks that are creating a nuisance in our community. Rufio West is a van dweller who bartends in town and spends his free time rock climbing. But lately, he's been organizing a network of his local transient community to fight the bylaw. I know there's an issue with garbage and human waste with some people who are extremely irresponsible. However, when I read the text of the bylaw, it seems extremely punitive. West says he's worried about the discretion the bylaw would give individual officers. Elliot says the goal is to give officials power to ask problem people to move along when necessary. She says the fine would likely be about $500. I'm pretty pissed about it. I mean, I think it's a really unfair bylaw that steer, like there's a lot of prejudice against van dwellers and people that live in tents out of necessity or choice. And if feel this bylaw is not a solution to the problem, which is garbage from irresponsible campers. Pigeon and West say if littering is the problem, deal with that. They both say they would dispute any fines they might get if the bylaw passes. Rafferty Baker, CBC News, Squamish. Well, it turns out driving an electric vehicle could save you thousands. BC Hydro compared the Honda Civic and the Nissan Leaf. Both are the most popular in their categories. A commuter doing an 80 kilometer round trip from Surrey to Vancouver would spend $409 a year in the electric Nissan Leaf. On the same commute, the gas powered Honda Civic would cost about $2,200. That's about a $1,700 more a year. The Ford F-150, well, it would cost you even more, about $3,800 a year to gas up for the exact same trip. 
we worked out that it's about 25 cents a litre cost on average to commute with uh, 25 cents a litre cost on average to commute with an electric vehicle, uh, which is only about 20% uh, of what it would cost you to do the same thing in a gas-powered vehicle. British Columbians buy electric cars at three times the rate of other provinces, and BC Hydro predicts there will be at least 300,000 fully electric cars on the road in the next decade. Former polygamous leader James Oler found guilty today in a child bride case. The former leader of a community practicing polygamy in Bountiful, B.C., is guilty of taking a 15-year-old girl from Canada to be married in the States. The judge saying it's reasonable to believe he knew the teen would be subjected to sexual activity. Oler had arranged the girl's marriage to an older member of the Fundamentalist Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. He's to be sentenced July 15th. A wet, muddy morning for residents of an East Vancouver neighborhood after the rupturing of a water main. At least one home flooded. <laughs> this area near Adnac and Lakewood Drive was closed for hours with debris flowing through the neighborhood. It started with a small leak reported to the city of Vancouver on May 4th, and it turned into a major gusher this morning, in the words of residents. The water was eventually turned off, but not before it washed out some of the roadbed. Over here, it looks like a big underground water supply just exploded um, and just started washing away the entire road. And I, I was parked over here, so I wanted to get my vehicle out of the way before the whole thing turned into a, you know, a total mess. Warren says when he woke up, it looked like there was a river flowing down the street. While a neighbor told the CBC she called the city about the water leak two weeks ago, but never received a response. The daughter of a man killed 10 years ago in Surrey is asking for help to catch his son's killer. Chris Widemy and another man were shot in the washroom of a strip club in Cloverdale. The other man survived, but as Mayor Baines reports, police say Widemy was an innocent bystander. I think it's gotten almost worse just because they're so out in the open. Lexis Whitney turns 20 in two months. She was nine years old when her father was killed. She wants whoever was responsible to be brought to justice. We're grieving at this point. It's kind of impossible to move on when I don't know what happened. It was a chaotic scene at a Cloverdale strip club. Police at the time said a gunman walked into the lounge and opened fire in the washroom. Two men were shot. 34-year-old Chris Whitney was one of them and died just after midnight on May 17th. Uh, we do recognize that this is the 10-year anniversary of Mr. Whitney's homicide. And again, our condolences go out to his family. And uh, all our unsaid homicides are, remain active and we are pursuing, uh, we will pursue leads as they come up. Police said at the time Whitney was not the intended target but was an innocent bystander. The other man survived the shooting. It's crazy to me that it's been 10 years and people still aren't coming forward about it. And I know that there are people that definitely know there's no way that the other man involved doesn't know what happened. And you don't get shot multiple times and not know who did it and not care who did it, not care to find out. <laughs> she has been asking for the public's help to find her father's killer since she was a young girl. Oh, he was awesome. <laughs> yeah, he was a really good guy. Um, yeah, he was uh, super funny. He was really sarcastic, and I got that from him. Um, yeah, it's hard. I try to remember a lot of it, but it's kind of hard because I was so young. Moments after the fatal shooting took place, investigators said a man in his early 20s wearing dark clothing and a dark hooded sweatshirt was seen fleeing the lounge through the rear of the building. Anyone with information is being asked to contact police. Mira Baines, CBC News, Surrey. All right, a long wait today for Australians in Vancouver hoping to vote in that country's upcoming federal election. Hundreds of Australians lined up outside the consulate downtown this morning to exercise their right to vote. That is the only place in B.C. they can cast their ballots, and today was the last day to do it. In Australia, all eligible citizens are required to register and vote in elections, and that includes those living abroad. Well, a major rock slide has ripped away the north face of Joffrey Peak near Pemberton. It happened yesterday morning around 9 a.m. It's the second major rock slide in a week in that area, and it was significant enough to register on seismometers 300 kilometers away on Vancouver Island. 
The first slide sent a flow of debris more than four kilometers down the peak. The good news is neither slide is threatening Joffrey Provincial Park or its famous turquoise colored lakes. Well, how would you react if a pod of orca whales swam under your boat? Well, that's exactly what happened to one group off the coast of Gambier Island. And to say they were excited would be an understatement. Take a look. It's right there. Oh my gosh, it's right here. Whoa. Bradford MacArthur and his family were out on their boat when they spotted the pod of transient orcas. The whales then began to swim toward the boat where they showed off for a while before eventually diving under the ship. It just turned a hard 90 degrees and came right at us. Um, right around then I ran up the mast to get a better vantage point and we kind of just started holding our breath, holding our breath. And we're like, no way, no way they're coming oh my gosh and then suddenly they're just right there and they literally can't be closer and we're just you can hear us all we're just losing it we're like way too excited oh, what a sight God. after diving under the boat he says the orca came up with a whale in his mouth uh, they then continued to play around for a little bit before swimming off Well, that looked like a beautiful day. That um, was really nice. <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> Not as nice today, a little bit cloudy. Yeah, we had a little bit of everything today. I mean, I honestly was expecting it to be not a super good day, that is. But uh, in the end, we did have a little break here and there. And uh, a bit of sunshine came out. But of course, as you know, it is the long weekend. Your long range forecast or long weekend forecast is here. Wanted to give you all of those details. But did you know, first of all, that this is a different name, basically, wherever you are across the country? For some people call it Victoria Day. Some call it just the May Long. And uh, if anyone like me from Ontario, this is, of course, the May 2-4. So I wanted to walk you through what you can be expecting throughout this this whole weekend. Saturday, this is probably going to still be our nicest day of the weekend. We're dealing with a mix of sun and clouds, and depending on where you are, this could be a little bit more sun than clouds. Temperatures right around that 20 degree mark, which is going to be nice. For Sunday, it's going to be probably mostly a cloudy day, especially to start. Uh, but then toward the late evening and into Victoria Day proper, that's going to be the day to be watching for the rain to come through. Now, it's not going to be significant, maybe about five millimeters at most, but that's probably going to be the day to make sure that you've got maybe some indoor activities planned, or maybe it's your recovery day, something you do inside that day. As we're talking about other places outside of Vancouver for Saturday, you're going to notice that some of the warmth is actually going to be farther inland. So we're talking about you in the Tri-Cities there. Down towards Surrey, New West, and Burnaby, you're going to be comfortably in 20 degrees. And I wouldn't be surprised as even just a little bit away from the water in Vancouver, we could be doing that as well. Now, in terms of when that rain is going to be coming, it's more into the long range, but I do want to mention that overnight tonight, very brief risk of showers is going to be expected throughout the pre-dawn hours before eventually it clears out for the rest of the day. All right, thanks very much, Brett. You're welcome. That is it for our Facebook and YouTube show tonight. If you miss any of these stories or you want to watch some more, we will be on live on television after the game tonight. And if not, Leanne Young is here at 11 o'clock with your next local news. Have a good night.